I almost didn't go to Kashmir. In 2013, three days before I was set to leave Delhi for the region, I read an article in the Times of India that reported militants had killed eight Indian soldiers. Don't go there, an Indian told me at his tea stall. There's always war there. It's dangerous there. To a certain extent, he was right. War has been Kashmir's reality since 1947, almost 70 years, three generations. The political interests of Pakistan and India's governments impose the conflict onto Kashmiri people. Both countries claim Kashmir. Currently, India occupies the southern half and Pakistan occupies the northern half and a western region. The Indian government claims that the presence of its forces in Kashmir is necessary to ensure security, but their presence has brought violence that extends beyond battlefields. Kashmiri journalist Sanjay Kak points out that state violence is enforced with impunity. Its threat works hand in hand with fear, hopelessness, and the traumatization of the spirit. It results in militarization not only of the land, but of the mind. War uses power to enforce submission and to close minds for the purpose of political acquiescence. War depends on the force of fear to control people's thoughts, beliefs, and their actions. Violence cripples a person's agency and turns what was once possible impossible. As violence becomes normalized, so does hopelessness. Victims of violence aren't the only ones who are subject to the closing of minds. Representations of war in the media often narrow outsiders' perceptions of events. When we think of war and protest, we think of easy to identify images. We think of angry young men setting army trucks on fire and exploding ho homemade bombs in, in the streets. We think of the armed response, a fog of tear gas and flying bullets. In Kashmir, the persistent image of war is stone throwers, teenagers who pick up rocks and hurl them at soldiers. The stones are propelled by frustration and despair. What we don't see as frequently are the creative ways of addressing the conflict and resisting violence that local people employ every day to retain a vestige of humanity and hope. Why is creativity important to consider in a war context? Because history has shown us the violence that closed minds can produce. Extremist groups like ISIS thrive off of an ideology of rigid, radical thought, transforming free-thinking individuals into agents of terrorism. When minds are closed, people lose their identity, their humanity, and sense of liberty. When that happens, it becomes easy to submit to extremism. I'm here to tell you a different story than the one of Kashmiri stone throwers. I want to introduce you to some of the Kashmiris who are leveraging creativity to open minds around them, reclaim their identity, and reignite hope in a self-determined future. This story is not new. Kashmir has a long tradition of artistic expression. The, peop the Kashmiri people have long been renowned for their painting, woodworking, textiles, and architecture. Creative expression is deeply embedded into a sense of Kashmiri culture and identity. No doubt the strong reverence for creative expression is why so many Kashmiris have employed alternative artistic ways to resist violence and overcome oppression. I want to begin with the creativity employed by Kashmiris who will not allow violence's oppression to create hopelessness. Their work reflects the belief that their futures will not be militarized. Fahad Shah's book of Occupation and Resistance, a collection of essays from Kashmiris, includes many examples on, of this focus on a free future. Shokat Nanda, a Kashmiri photojournalist, writes, I am here demanding a different life, a life where the, la where, the life, where the land I belong to exists as a nation on the map of the world, where I do not live and die with an uncertain identity a life where there are no bunkers, no checkpoints, and no barriers of coiled razor wire, where I am not greeted by gun-wielding soldiers on my way to school, where my parents are not humiliated every day, where I am not killed in a playground with a cricket ball still in my hand, and where I am not thrown in the shadows of despair and frustration. Shokat Nanda's writing reflects an open mind in the largest sense, one that is capable of seeing a world beyond the violence surrounding him. In Kashmir, 
I was struck by the number of people using journalism, photography, and film to document events and to preserve memory and identity. Local online newspapers such, and magazines such as Rising Kashmir and the Kashmir Walla and documentaries such as Inshallah Kashmir and Children of Conflict drive a wedge into the military's control of the war's narrative and reveal Kashmiri voices. Kashmiris have long known photography's power in documenting personal histories. Often, when I entered someone's home, they would show me their family's scrapbook. Many would also say how, during intense periods of violence, they would hide or even burn photographs to protect themselves. Today, a Facebook page called Old Kashmir Images posts photographs of Kashmir during the 20th and 19th century. These are some of their photos. The page has 100,000 followers. The appeal of the image may be their ability to transport Kashmiris from their land scarred with razor wire and concrete barriers back to a pristine, unoccupied Kashmir. The photos of, our, of, our the past, are of the past, but they provide visions for a future Kashmir whose ownership is in the hands of the people once again. Uzma Falak, a Kashmiri journalist, a woman I might add, has written, in oppressed societies, memory becomes a political tool, a means of resisting oppression. In the absence of a free homeland, memory becomes a homeland, unoccupied, free, unassailable. Fahad Shah wrote in his book, no matter the pain, preserving these remembrances is all that Kashmiris can think of doing for their future generations. In the simplest sense, memories open the mind to an understanding of the past. This knowledge can allow for individuals to reclaim a collective identity that oppression has stifled. Feelings of empowerment reawaken belief in liberty's possibilities. This empowerment has led to a growing Kashmiri participation in parkour. Parkour is a French sport that combines free running with gymnastics. It has been said that parkour challenges a person to imagine new possibilities for navigating their environment. It trains the mind to overcome emotional and mental barriers, as well as physical ones. Zahid Shah, a 22-year-old Kashmiri, founded the Kashmir Free Runner and Parkour Federation in 2012. He said, parkour is more of an art than a sport. You do parkour by your own rules. You build new obstacles and overcome them. When the conflict got bad in 2010, parkour was a stress breaker for us. Freedom is not just about asking for a new state. It is about free vision. Zahid's group of parkour artists demonstrates an alternative way to overcome the state's control. For, Kash for Kashmiris, parkour opens minds to the power of an indiv individual's ability to reach their goals. Freedom is expressed in the flips, leaps, and spins of parkour artists. Satire is one of the most widely used forms of creative resistance to oppression. Kashmir has a long history of political and social satire expressed through performance. Ban Bathers, traveling theater groups, performed in villages throughout the 20th century. Their plays spread news and offered critical responses to local political issues. In 1989, militarization brought suppression of free speech, and more than 100 Ban tr troops dispersed. The remaining troops stuck to performing safer, pre-1947 themes popular during a time when Kashmir was still independent in order to remain safe from persecution. One scriptwriter, however, wrote a piece that satirized the current normalization of violence in Kashmir. The piece is quoted on the screen, but summarized, it shows how a humorous language-based miscommunication between a Kashmiri-speaking civilian and a Hindi-speaking soldier leads to the soldier beating up the Kashmiri. It shows the power of art in challenging political violence, especially art forms that draw from historical artistic identity. Of course, the expression of satire does not require a stage. It is evoked in private conversations among friends and sometimes is even used publicly to challenge authority. One day, I was eating lunch with a Kashmiri named Fayez when I noticed Pakistan's green and white flag folded neatly in the kitchen's corner. I asked Fayez if he wanted Kashmir to be part of Pakistan. He laughed. I don't think that Pakistan would make things much better, but I do know that when I go to a protest and I raise my Pakistani flag, the faces of Indian soldiers turn, always turn red with rage. We cry, long live Pakistan, and it makes them so angry they almost cry. 
He continued laughing and then asked me, how long will you stay in Kashmir? I told him that I would leave the end of August. Ah, he said, then you'll be here on August 15th, India's Independence Day. A mischievous smile spread across his face. This is also Pakistan, this is the day after Pakistan's Independence Day. So on August 15th, we shout to every Indian official we see, happy belated Independence Day. I first started thinking about creative resistance's ability to open minds in the backseat of Samir's car. We were driving through the traffic of Boulevard Road, the main route around Dahl Lake. Samir turned to me and said, if you're to understand our movement, you need to hear MC Cash. He pressed play on a CD and music pulsed out of the speakers. The song was one of unity, dreaming, and freedom. Rushan Alahi, MC Cash's name, was born in 1990, the beginning of a period of, of horrible fighting in Kashmir. He grew up surrounded by violence, but managed to become a business student. Through music, he has created a space to encourage other Kashmiris to hope, to dream, and to find freedom. He chooses to sing in English to spread his me message further. Next is a clip of the song, Listen, My Brother, with some of the lyrics on the screen. Examples of creative expression as a means of resistance can be found around the world. If we look, we can find it in poetry in Iran, graffiti art in Palestine, music in Mali, documentary film in Colombia, and protest signs in Ferguson. For me, the lesson learned in Kashmir is that even when communities experience a chronic state of mind-numbing war resulting in systematic brutality, their essential humanity cannot be absolutely repressed people will find ways to carve out creative spaces to free themselves from the militarization of the mind. In doing so, they will hold on to a basic human desire for dignity and identity. And, if they can, they will share their art to revive and reconstitute their community so they can be whole once more. Thank you. <laughs>